Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. A recently married couple were on a long road trip through the heart of the United States. One night, it was raining hard, and the headlights of their car flashed across an obviously cold, wet man on the side of the road hitching a lift. They weren't usually ones for taking hitchhikers, but the weather was so bad that the husband pulled over and offered the guy a lift. The man thanked them and climbed in. He seemed a bit agitated and edgy, but who wouldn't be after walking down the street in such a downpour? He barely spoke a word for the whole journey, and eventually the couple dropped him off at a crossroads where he had asked them to let him out, despite the rain coming down in sheets. The couple drove on for a good while when suddenly the car gives out and no amount of keying the ignition will make it start again. They try turning on the radio, to no avail. The battery is completely drained. So the husband tells his wife to stay in the car while he walks ahead in the rain to try and get help. The woman locks the doors and sits in silence. Without even the car radio to keep her company, she eventually dozes off. She wakes up, seeing flashing police lights through the water coming down the windshield and a voice through a loudspeaker, "'Ma'am, open the door! Get out of the car and run towards us as soon as you can! Do it now!' The woman's confused but gets out of the car and puts her hands above her head. "'Run and don't look back!' orders the police officer but how do you resist doing so once you hear that? So the woman turns. In the flashing blue lights of the police car and illuminated by flashes of lightning, she sees, on top of her car, the hitchhiker that they had helped earlier, who could clearly be seen with a machete, hacking at the dismembered corpse of her husband, with blood streaming over her car. She screams and faints as a flurry of gunshots ring out. The woman awakes in an ambulance a few moments later, still in shock. The ambulance is still sitting by the side of the road where the woman's car and husband both lay dead. Over the police radio, she hears that the murderer that had just escaped from the area's maximum security prison was now back in custody, now with another murder to add to his rap sheet and upcoming trials. Hitchhiking can be a dangerous way to travel, even for those who are doing the picking up. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, the open road is a beautiful place where you can make friends that you'd otherwise never meet and have adventures that'll change your life. But there are also extreme dangers to traveling with strangers on highways and back roads. No matter how trustworthy or well-intentioned a driver might seem, it's nearly impossible to tell if they are actually a predator or murderer preying upon innocent hitchhikers. Creepy true hitchhiker stories can make you think twice before picking up that stranger at the side of the road or trying to thumb it yourself. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to connect with me on social media, and more. A quick warning about this episode, I've tried to clean up some of the language used, but the graphic descriptions of what happened to some people will be extremely disturbing for some listeners, including facts about necrophilia and rape listener discretion is strongly advised. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. No one actively thinks that they're going to be killed by a hitchhiker or by the person who picks them up if they're the one doing the hitching. Unfortunately for everyone in the stories I'm sharing tonight, whether they survived or not, they experienced unspeakable terror. Whether the driver is John Wayne Gacy, 
someone wanting to keep them as a sex slave under a waterbed for several years, or a random man wielding an axe. These true stories about hitchhikers should hopefully serve as cautionary tales. Jackie Ansel Lamb was last seen in May 1970 when she was trying to hitch a ride from London to her home in Manchester. Six days later, her semi-nude body was discovered by a farmer outside of Knutsford, England. Investigators discovered that Ansel Lamb had been sexually assaulted before she was strangled with electrical wire and dumped on the side of the road. Although no official suspect has ever been named, police believe that prolific English serial killer Peter Tobin is to blame. Be careful when you are trekking across New Zealand, especially if you are carrying any special belongings. One German man who was traveling the country on foot had all of his stuff stolen from him by a middle-aged man in a white Honda near Timaru in February 2016. The hitchhiker said, until now, it seemed to be a really safe country. Maybe I put too much trust in people. From Redditor The Best Genes So this was told to me by an old family friend, Nikki, numerous times as a kid growing up as one of those life advice stories to keep in mind through the years, and to her credit, I have never forgotten it. Whenever anything associated with hitchhiking comes up, it always springs to mind, and probably always will. Makes me a bit ill whenever I think about it, actually. So, Nikki, who grew up at the same time as my dad, around the early 80s, was a young woman in her mid-twenties. She is one of those real kind-hearted souls, always willing to help another out in a time of need, you know? And I can't imagine her being anything other than that when she was younger, so I totally see her doing this, too. So, driving into the city, about a two-hour drive from town, she saw a man walking down the side of the road. As she neared him, he turned and, in typical hitchhiker manner, stuck out the old arm and thumb. Nikki, bless her heart, pulled over and asked him if he needed any help. She told me that he was really polite, if not a bit shy, when he asked for a lift into the city. Nikki gave a smile and popped open the passenger door for the guy, who tossed his bag into the back seat and buckled up for the ride ahead. They talked pleasantly for most of the trip about friends, the news, etc. She felt they were getting on really well and even bought him dinner at the pit stop a little over halfway there. She says that he seemed really flustered and awkward when she paid, but one of the things that they had talked about was money and how he was pretty dang strapped for cash, which was why he was hitchhiking in the first place. But he eventually relented and they went on their way. As soon as they got into the city, he thanked her profusely for the ride and the food and asked to be dropped off once they hit downtown. Before getting out, he asked for Nikki's phone number so he could contact her someday and catch up. Thrilled at the prospect of knowing how her new friend was faring, Nikki wrote it down for him and drove off with the warm feeling of a good deed done. Now, I'm sorry if you were expecting something creepy to have happened by now, but I think this is what freaked me out so much as a kid how nice everything seemed to have worked out. Nikki would get this crease in her forehead and a funny look in her eye when she would tell me the next part. A week later, she got a phone call from her driving buddy. He didn't let her get a word in edgewise after hello and told her that she should thank God that she was raised so nice because when he first got in her car, he was planning on raping and murdering her once they got to that pit stop, that he was going to steal that car and dump her body in a ditch further down the road and go on his merry way. But after she talked with him so kindly and treated him to dinner with a smile on her face, he couldn't bring himself to do it. He didn't think that he could live with himself after doing that to such a nice lady. And to please, please, Nikki, please, never, ever pick up another hitchhiker, he said. Then he hung up the phone. Nikki never got a call from him again. When she tried redialing the number, she got a payphone. And so, Mr. Hitchhiker, I know I'm never going to meet you because I'm going to listen to the advice that you gave your driving buddy and never, ever pick up a hitchhiker. From a former Redditor There was a story on NPR about a man hitchhiking across the country who got a ride from a couple. A while after he got home, he saw them on the news. They had killed a man earlier and were driving with his corpse in their car. They had killed and robbed a few people before then. He was surprised because they were so nice. Remember, niceness does not equal goodness. Anyone can be nice. From Redditor Muttermag That reminds me of the woman in the box. She accepted a ride from a couple with a baby. 
They kidnapped her and held her for seven years. I heard her story when I was a kid, and it's the reason that I would never hitchhike. From the late 80s to the early 2000s, the bodies of as many as 12 hitchhikers, including 18-year-old Catherine Graham and 32-year-old Tony Jones, turned up on a desolate stretch of highway outside the cattle town of Hugenden. This stretch of highway has been dubbed the Highway of Death as a result. The murders remain unsolved. Thus far, it's impossible to know if all the murders are the work of a single killer or if this part of the Australian outback is an area where bodies of victims can be easily and secretly discarded. From a former Redditor, there's this middle-aged man who lives in the town I'm from. He was a genuinely sweet and caring person, and mind, this is a really small town. One day he picked up a hitchhiker just outside of town. He told him to jump in the bed of the truck and he'll drive him to Walmart. About halfway there, the hitchhiker shot him in the back of the head for no reason. He didn't even steal anything and if I remember correctly, he got caught. Henry didn't die, but he's permanently disabled and has severe brain damage. I remember when I first heard that, and it scared the crap out of me. This was probably about 12 years ago now, but I still think about it any time somebody talks about hitchhikers. It scares me to think someone would do something like that just because. On May 19, 1977, 20-year-old Colleen Stan decided to hitchhike 400 miles from Eugene, Oregon to surprise her friend in Westwood, California for her birthday. She was less than 100 miles away from her destination when she had the misfortune of running into Cameron Hooker, a 23-year-old lumber mill worker. Hooker was traveling with his wife and baby when he picked up Colleen and forced her to be a sex slave in their home for seven years. During that time, Colleen slept in a box under the couple's waterbed and was repeatedly raped and tortured. She wasn't freed until 1984, when Hooker's wife helped her escape and get to a bus stop. At his trial, Hooker was sentenced to 104 years in prison. From Redditor Jayola First of all, I want to apologize for any mistakes. English isn't my first language, and even though I'll try my best to avoid it, I'll probably mess up something. The story took place two years ago. I was on my second week backpacking through Austria, and I reached a point where I was too exhausted to walk any longer. It was an unusually hot day. I had blisters all over my feet, and I was ready to call it quits. I was in the middle of nowhere and decided to thumb a lift to the nearest train station. But I was out of luck. I stood there for what felt like hours, and no car would pick me up. I don't blame them. I spent two weeks sleeping in the woods, my clothes were dirty, and I probably looked like a maniac when finally a truck pulled up, and I didn't hesitate to hop inside because I was so thankful to be able to sit down and rest my feet for a while. I asked the driver if he could drop me at the nearest station so that I could catch a train to Vienna, but he told me that he was heading back there anyway and that he could take me there as long as I didn't mind him making a stopover to load the truck. I didn't, and so we drove along together. We made some small talk, and he seemed to be very polite. It was a pretty enjoyable ride until we reached the first stop. He loaded his truck while I walked around a bit and bought some water at a gas station nearby. He had offered me drinks a few times along the ride, but I always declined because I don't feel comfortable with that. I got back into the truck and we continued the drive to Vienna. Almost immediately after we took off again, he told me that it wouldn't be a problem for him if I wanted to take off some clothes since it was such a hot day. I told him, no, I'm fine, but he brought it up a couple more times. He also asked me if I wanted to take a nap in the back and that he had several hitchhikers sleeping there in the past. I declined again and started to feel a little uneasy around him and planned to leave the truck at the next gas stop. All of a sudden, he nearly yelled at me to put my head down and hide because he was driving past his stepfather's car and he didn't want him to see me in the truck. That struck me as odd, but I did anyway because his yelling took me by surprise. That confirmed my resolution to get out of there as soon as possible, and I asked him to drop me off at the next stop and made up an excuse that it was my goal to enter Vienna by foot and that I was rested enough to make it now thanks to his lift. He agreed, and I got my stuff ready. He suddenly turned to me and said that I looked familiar and that he was sure that he'd seen me somewhere before. I shrugged it off, but he insisted he remembered my face somehow. He asked me if I ever went to a swingers club because he was sure that he saw me there sometime. That caught me off guard, and I told him that this was impossible because I had never been to one. Well, do you want to? 
I'm going to one in Vienna. Let's go there together. I'm sure you'll like it. At this point, I really wanted to get out of the truck ASAP, and I told him that I had no intention to come with him and asked him to drop me off now. He didn't answer, but reached into his pants and started pleasuring himself while he drove along. I froze up, clutching my backpack on my lap and didn't know what to do. I kept thinking that I'd jump off as soon as he stopped somewhere and tried to ignore what he was doing there since he didn't respond to my plea to let me out. The gas station was coming up and he stopped what he was doing and asked if we should take a shower together. I figured that there'd be people around and that it'd make it easier to get rid of him, so I told him, sure, why not? He pulled up and as soon as he stopped, I yanked open the door and ran across the parking area of the gas station hoping that he wouldn't come after me. He didn't, so I just kept running until the station was out of sight and I reached a busy street. Only after my heart stopped racing and I caught my breath did I realize that I had left my shoes in his truck. I walked the last few kilometers barefoot and kept a lookout for the truck until I reached Vienna. Edmund Kemper III, a psychopathic serial killer and necrophile who became known as the Co-Ed Killer, was born December 18, 1948 in Burbank, California. He was arrested in April of 1973 at the age of 24 after murdering six female students, his own mother, and a family friend. During childhood, Kemper was physically and emotionally abused by his alcoholic mother, Clarnell, who was divorced from his father. Clarnell frequently locked her son in a dark basement alone at night. Not surprisingly, Edmund grew up to hate his mother and at the age of 14 ran away from home in search of his father in Van Nuys, California. After locating but being rejected by his father, young Edmund was sent to live with his paternal grandmother and grandfather in North Fork, California. Kemper claims that his grandmother, similar to his mother, was very abusive and he disliked her intensely. Despite his relative youth upon capture, Kemper had actually committed his first two murders nearly a decade earlier. Kemper was an extremely intelligent child, but he engaged in psychopathic behavior early on. For Kemper, This behavior included the torture and killing of animals, which is a common childhood practice among nearly half of all serial killers. In 1964, at the age of 15, Edmund shot his grandmother in the head, allegedly just to see what it felt like. He then killed his grandfather, too, because he believed that his grandfather would be angry at him for killing his grandmother. Kemper was subsequently committed to the Atascadero State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. To his chagrin, he was released into his mother's care in 1969 after less than five years of confinement and treatment. His juvenile criminal record was expunged. As a young adult, Kemper stood six foot nine, weighing 280 pounds. He frequently thought about killing his mother by 1970, but was not yet ready to do so. The prospect of killing his mother without first perfecting his murder skills on others was too overwhelming for Kemper. Between May 1972 and February 1973, Kemper embarked on a series of six shocking serial murders in which he picked up hitchhiking female students along the highway and then transported them to rural areas where he would kill and then decapitate them and have sex with their corpses. He collected their dismembered heads in his apartment and would later have sex with them as well. He was buddies with all the local cops They would drink in a bar called The Jury Room with the very law enforcement officers who, unbeknownst to them, were pursuing him. His law enforcement friends began calling him Big Eddie. Kemper finally realized his ultimate fantasy and killed his mother with a claw hammer and strangled her best friend on Good Friday 1973. After having sex with his mother's decapitated head, Edmund Kemper casually telephoned the local law enforcement authorities to confess what he had done. The police initially refused to believe him, thinking that their friend Big Eddie was just pulling a prank on them. After several follow-up calls and the disclosure of information that only the co-ed killer would know, Kemper finally convinced the police that he was the man they were seeking. He was quickly arrested without incident and charged with eight murders in the first degree. Kemper was found guilty and given a life sentence because there was a stay on the death penalty in the United States at the time of his conviction. Kemper was asked by a Cosmopolitan magazine reporter during a prison interview how he felt when he saw a pretty girl after killing his mother. He said, One side of me says I'd like to talk to her, date her. The other side says, I wonder how her head would look on a stick. Edmund Kemper remains housed among the general prison population at California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California.
More true and terrifying hitchhiking stories coming up when Weird Darkness returns. Hey, weirdos! So, what brings you here? Our next weirdo watch party is this Saturday, May 4th. But don't go too far. This Saturday night, Dario Evil and his Mausoleum of Terror present Boris Karloff in 1971's Isle of the Snake People. Or just Snake People. It depends on which poster you're looking at. It's neither here nor there. An evil scientist runs an army of LSD crazed zombies. Come into my laboratory. I'd like to show you something. But then wouldn't that describe anybody on LSD? That is quite obvious. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun, and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the movie. Let's go for a drink. Well, that's totally up to you. Modern science has shown that alcohol is responsible for 99.2% of all the world's sins. I guess we have a lot of liquor and LSD in this film. What is this? Oh, this? Uh, that's a creepy crate. During the Weirdo Watch Party, I'll be giving away a creepy crate to one lucky winner, full of scary surprises like horror collectibles, true crime-themed accessories, books, terrifying trinkets, and more, with some Weird Darkness swag added in. You won't know what's in the creepy crate until you open it, and I'll be giving you instructions on how to win the creepy crate inside the chat during the movie, so you have to tune in to win. Are you making advances toward me? Well, if that's what it takes to get you to tune in, it's Isle of the Snake People this Saturday, May 4th, hosted by Dario Evil. I only hope it works. The show begins at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 7 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night, on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. You don't feel bad. Uh, um, thanks? Uh, hope to see you this Saturday, May 4th. Leave this forgotten island in peace. The idea of hitchhiking across the world and relying on the kindness of strangers to get you from point A to point Z is a romantic one. But for every cinematic story of people meeting at a truck stop and becoming best friends, there are hundreds of real-life hitchhiking horror stories. The stories I'm sharing with you tonight should convince you that hitchhiking is simply not safe. You could end up kidnapped, injured, or possibly even dead. Between 1972 and 1973, Santa Rosa, California experienced the killings of seven women whose murders have never been solved. An eighth probable victim disappeared and her body has never been located. All of the victims were known to hitchhike, a popular mode of transportation during that time. These murders became known as the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders. The so-called Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders have been linked to other crimes that occurred in the late 1960s and early 70s where the facts have been distorted to meet the criteria of the particular murderer thought to have committed them, most notably the Zodiac Killer and Ted Bundy. These murders remain unsolved. On March 5, 1972, two high school students made a terrifying discovery – the nude body of a woman lying in a creek bed. The body was that of Kim Wendy Allen, a 19-year-old who had last been seen hitchhiking to school and carrying a wooden soy barrel with red Chinese characters on it. Coroners soon discovered that Kim was tortured to death before being dumped. Her wrists and ankles had been bound, and she had been raped before being strangled by a cord. Investigators determined that she was strangled slowly over the course of a half hour. Kim was last seen on Enterprise Road in Santa Rosa. Her body was found eight miles east of there, and it was not going to be the last body the police found. Santa Rosa is a town located north of San Francisco, just 20 miles from the California coast in Sonoma County. During the late 60s and early 70s, it found itself caught in a political upheaval because of its proximity to the hippie movement in San Francisco. In March of 1972, a prison riot broke out at the county jail. In 1968, the infamous Zodiac Killer was making headlines for several murders in the San Francisco Bay Area, and down in Los Angeles around that same time, Charles Manson and his followers were the lead suspects in a series of home invasion killings in and around the Hollywood Hills. In other words, 
There was no shortage of crime, murder, and mayhem in California during this period. That's why the discovery of a body on the side of the road, although a major cause for concern, probably didn't raise a lot of eyebrows. On April 27, 1972, almost two months after the discovery of Kim Allen, friends reported the disappearance of 20-year-old Jeanette Kamahili, who was last seen hitchhiking some 20 miles from where Kim was found. Rumors and connections were immediately made as officials began warning co-eds against hitchhiking to class and work. Residents were beginning to think a serial killer might be at work, a belief that was further fueled by the discovery of two more bodies in an embankment northeast of Santa Rosa. The bodies were that of Maureen Sterling and Yvonne Weber. Both 12-year-old middle school students were last seen February 4, 1972, hitchhiking on Gurneville Road. Their skeletal remains were found six months later. Their cause of death would never be determined. Before police could even completely identify their new victims, another body emerged. Lori Lee Curse's mother reported the 13-year-old girl missing on November 11, 1972. Believed to have run away from home and known to hitchhike, Lori was last seen visiting friends in Santa Rosa 10 days after her mother reported her missing. On December 14, the 8th grader's body was found down an embankment off Calistoga Road in North Santa Rosa. The cause of death was a broken neck. But with Lori's death came a potential break in the case. A witness came forward, claiming to have seen two men force a young girl matching Lori's description into their van. The witness claimed that two men grabbed the girl and threw her into the back of a van which was being driven by a white man with an Afro hairstyle. Carolyn Davis was a 14-year-old runaway from Anderson, California, a small town three hours north of Santa Rosa. Carolyn ran away from her home on February 6, 1973. She was last seen alive by her grandmother, who dropped her off at the Garberville Post Office two hours north of Santa Rosa on July 15. Witnesses claimed to have seen a young girl matching Carolyn Davis's description hitchhiking down Highway 101 heading towards Santa Rosa. Her body was discovered one year after Maureen Sterling and Yvonne Weber vanished in only three feet from the exact spot where their bodies were discovered. The cause of death was strychnine poisoning. Teresa Walsh was last seen on December 22, 1973, at Zuma Beach in Malibu, California, 460 miles from Santa Rosa. Friends said she was intent on hitchhiking north to Garberville so she could spend the holidays with her family. She never made it home. Instead, on December 28, 1973, the 23-year-old's body was discovered by boaters, partially submerged in Mark West Creek just west of Santa Rosa. She was the sixth victim found in Sonoma County in just two years. Truth is, they had no solid evidence, and Bundy never took credit for these crimes. So still, the killer could have possibly just gotten away with these awful murders. From Redditor, Jason is so handsome. Not my story, but my history teacher's hitchhiker's story. As a teenager, my teacher lived in Cook County, Illinois, and frequently would walk around town or the city as most people do. One day, he was offered a ride by a largish man in a car and hitchhiked home. The driver had a clown suit and makeup kit in the back of his car because he said that he worked as a clown part-time, which should have sent bells ringing, but he thought nothing of it. So he got driven to his mom's house and thanked the driver and left. My history teacher said the driver was one of the most polite people he had ever met. A few years later, my teacher found out the man he got into a car with was none other than John Wayne Gacy Jr. If you're traveling through Iceland, it's not out of the ordinary to hitchhike across the small glacial country. But on August 16, 1982, sisters Yvette and Marie Bohad were trekking across the beautiful country and accepted a ride that would change their world forever. The driver, Ritar Amason, dropped the two sisters off at a cabin before accusing them of hiding cannabis, bashing Marie in the head with a rock, and shooting Yvette with a shotgun. Marie survived by hiding in a sleeping bag and running after a police car that happened to drive by. Amason was convicted of murder. From Redditor, Iran RPCV. I stopped around sunset when I saw someone at the side of the interstate on the way to Phoenix from Tucson. As soon as I stopped, he and three more people got into the car. Before I could say anything, a spotlight hit my mirror and a state police officer came up, asked me if I was okay, and started questioning my new passengers in Spanish. He said to them, 
you know you have a carload of illegal aliens here, don't you? He then said that I could turn them over to him and he'd keep them in jail overnight and turn them into INS in the morning, take them up to the next exit and drop them off, or take them to where they were originally headed. Not quite sure I understood him, I asked him to repeat that. He said the same thing again. I said that if he didn't mind, I would take them to their destination, which turned out to be an orchard a few miles up the road. He wished me a good evening and left, while my passengers kept repeating, Amigo, Amigo. In July 2016, a hitchhiker near Brackpan, South Africa, accepted a ride from two unknown men and ended up on the worst ride of his life. After two more men, seemingly hitchhikers, got in the car, they grimly told him that he'd gotten into the wrong car. One of the men then punched the hitchhiker in the face before tying him up and shooting him five times in the leg. Since this happened while the car was in motion, the driver ended up accidentally running into the wall of a house in Quathima. The suspects fled the scene and left the hitchhiker in the car. Despite injuries sustained, he did survive. From Redditor Grusilik My aunt's eldest son hitchhiked a lot through New Brunswick back in the 70s. He vanished one summer, and the best the police could come up with was that he was picked up by someone, murdered, and his body was dumped in the St. John River. They never found his body, and my aunt never got closure. My mother told me that when I was young to discourage me from hitchhiking and Heck, it worked. From Redditor Sumat My older brother picked up a hitchhiker once after a night of light drinking. The way I heard the story relayed was that after driving for a few minutes, the man pulled out a shotgun, who knows how he concealed it, the cops never really figured out that detail of the story, and declared that he was going to steal the car. Well, my brother, being the self-proclaimed tough guy, said that he wasn't going to have this, so he stopped and tried to pull the guy out of the car to the ground. Next thing you know, my brother has a shotgun wound that blew off a chunk of his bicep, and the hitchhiker runs off. He made a decent recovery, but he still has a chunk gone from his arm, and he's not able to lift heavy things anymore with that arm. I will never pick up a hitchhiker. Polish man traveling through Ireland to buy a car flagged down another car for a ride that seemed to belong to a family. Once in the car, he didn't mind sitting between two children. One was a six-month-old, the other was eight years old. After about 15 minutes, though, he realized all was not as it seemed when they locked him in and met up with a second car on a side road. Even though the hitchhiker gave his attackers all his money, they stabbed him five or six times in the legs, in front of the children. Paramedics arrived on the scene just in time to save the man's life. From a former Redditor, this story comes from my father's experience as a hitchhiker. During the late 60s and early 70s, when he was between 13 and 16 years old, my father took off for the summer and went on a big trip around northeast Quebec. Apparently, his parents didn't care about him. Anyway, as he's going along, he gets picked up by a bunch of Americans headed up the same way. I can't recall if these guys were draft dodgers or vets, but either way, it became pretty clear to him that these guys were not completely sane. Not wanting to draw their attention to this fact, he figured that he'd take the ride and then ditch them as soon as possible. That first night, they end up in some sort of RV campground. While setting up their stuff, one of the rangers comes over and starts giving them trouble. Either they had not paid their fees or didn't want to pay or whatever. After a little while, the ranger leaves, and the Americans are really bothered by this guy. Rather than address the issue, they start putting together a plan to off the guy, They'd apparently brought some rifles across the border and thought it'd be easier to kill the ranger than be hassled about paying fees. My dad's generally a calm guy, but when he realized what was going on and that these guys would not be talked out of it, he was thinking, what am I getting myself into? The next time the ranger comes back, my dad approaches him right away and tells him that he's got to go. I'm not sure if he paid the guy or just warned him, but either way, the ranger left and did not come back. The craziest part of the story, in my opinion, is that I think he stayed with the guys for a few more days. Rather than peace the heck out like most people would do, they kept him on with them. Probably saved a ranger's life and saved himself from a much worse fate. On September 7, 1982, two men from upstate New York picked up an 18-year-old hitchhiker named Randall Shoptwees, who was making his way to Alaska. The men had been drinking all day and made the decision to rob the hitchhiker before pulling over to pick him up. When they picked up Shoptwees, he resisted their robbery attempt, however, and they managed to handcuff him and slit his throat. 
The knife penetrated him so deeply that when Chaptuise's body was found, his head was almost completely severed. Both men were sentenced and remain in prison today. From Redditor Hootbear I was 18 at the time, driving to get some food on my lunch break. I saw a man probably in his 50s trying to hitch a ride. I was pretty hesitant to stop, so I drove by. I felt guilty, though, remembering my mom always stopping to help people stranded on the road, the homeless, people out of gas, etc., so I turned around and offered the man a ride. He introduced himself, I can't remember his name, and he thanked me so profusely. He apparently had groceries and told me that he didn't want his meat to spoil in the hot New Mexico weather. He has to be dropped off at the post office, which was not too far away. As I drive towards the post office, he stared at me for a good minute, and the sirens went off in my head. Awkward, creepy, and unsettling. After a bit, he blurted out, you sure are pretty, and asked me for a number. I said, no, I have a boyfriend, and I'm not interested in the least bit. He kept asking and insisting my relationship status was irrelevant. I asked him to stop, and he became aggressive. I veered into the closest turn-in, slammed on my brakes, and yelled, is it too much to ask for a little good karma every now and then? Get out of my car, you cad! Yes, I said cad. He gave me a blank look, then just got out, much to my surprise. He ended up forgetting his groceries, and what scared me most is the fact that there was no meat, just some eggplants and nonsense. Now that I'm older and hopefully smarter, I'll think about who I pick up a little more. That, and it also helps having my 80-pound dog in tow with me. In the 90s, trucker Keith Hunter Jesperson was the wrong guy to hitch a ride with. He was a serial killer who at one time claimed to have murdered 160 victims, although he later recanted this confession and admitted that he'd only killed eight women. His method was to pick victims up at a gas station or on the side of the road, strangle them, and dump their bodies in another state. One woman, who he let use his credit card to make a long-distance call, woke him up in the middle of the night, making him angry enough to kill her. In order to destroy all evidence of his crime, he then strapped her to the bottom of his truck and dragged her along the highway until she was unrecognizable. From Redditor, Raccoon Yeti Kiwi I didn't pick him up myself, but I was with my father who was driving. We got him during the rain. He had long hair that covered his eyes, and he was carrying an axe. He looked oddly like a long-haired Hitler, and he had the dark hair and mustache. He was extremely polite, though, and we dropped him off where he needed to go with no problems. I like to think that he was a very polite murderer, or did that all the time, just to see how people would react. While hitchhiking across New Zealand in 1989, Urban Hoagland and Heidi Pakonan disappeared outside of Thames, a city on the southwestern end of the country's North Island. Despite a massive search for the couple, nothing was discovered until Hoagland's body was found in 1991. Pakonan's body was never found. Native New Zealander David Tamahir was convicted of their murders and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Controversy continues to surround the legitimacy of that conviction. Tamahir continues to deny that he played any part in the murders. From Redditor, how about me? I stopped for hitchhikers. Some background, I'm 36 now. When I was 13 or 15, I used to hitchhike out in the country to get around when visiting family who lived in the country. It started when I was walking, and someone who knew the area just offered me a ride. When I was a kid, everyone was perfectly pleasant, and nothing untoured ever happened. Flash forward many years. I've picked up hitchhikers off and on, my dad used to as well. The weirdest one he picked up was some Navajo guy who was walking in the middle of the desert while he was doing long-haul trucking. The guy literally was in the middle of nowhere during a time of the year that the weather could have killed him. He picked him up and traveled with him for about 300 miles, and eventually he got stopped by the police, and the guy he picked up got arrested. They threatened my dad with aiding and abetting, but nothing came of it, and they took the guy away. My dad picked him up again several days later, driving back, and found out the police kept him for a day or two and then dropped him off back in the middle of the desert near where he was picked up the first time. My dad took him over the state lines to El Paso, and he got out and was perfectly pleasant the whole time. In the early 70s, Douglas Gretzler and his friend William Steelman went on a killing spree that left 17 people dead in less than two months. The duo's crimes escalated from stealing a hitchhiker's clothes and money after tying him to a tree 
to killing a hitchhiker in Arizona and dumping his body in the Superstition Mountains while on their way to murder two other friends so they wouldn't suspect the duo of murdering two of their mutual friends. Gretzler was executed in 1998 for his crimes. From Redditor, A Brutal Cow Not my story, but my dad's. He was traveling through Arizona on his way to Mexico. He looked to the side of the road and saw a man hitchhiking. My dad pulled over and asked where the guy was going, to which the man said, the next town over. My dad, being a very trusting man, and this being the 70s or 80s, decided he'd give the guy a ride. While they're driving, they start talking, and my father asked for his name. His name, he said, was Derp. My dad, quite shocked, looked at him and replied, holy crap, that's my name! They had a few small conversations, and at the next town, my dad let him out and continued to Mexico. He eventually reached the border. He pulled up, and the border official asked to see his license. He took a good long look at the license. The official then took off his big aviator sunglasses and told him to pull over to the side of the road. My dad got out of the car, and they put him in a room while they searched his car. He was sitting in the room for a good few hours, admiring the entire wall of confiscated tequila when the officer walked back in and apologized for the wait. My dad asked what the reason was, and the officer replied, there's a warrant out for the arrest of Derp. Once again, dazed, my dad asked, what for? The officer replied, murder. My dad dang near crapped his pants. Joseph Naso, a 79-year-old photographer, was dubbed the alphabet killer for his alleged penchant for killing sex workers with names featuring the same first and last letter. He allegedly killed one woman after picking her up as she hitchhiked home. He was arrested in 2010 after detectives discovered a diary of sexual assaults, a list of locations where he disposed of bodies, and photos of scantily clad women that appeared unconscious or deceased. Ben Rhodes is a trucker who allegedly admitted that he had been torturing women for 15 years as he crisscrossed America by highway. The sadistic trucker kept a briefcase full of alligator clips, leashes, handcuffs, whips, and various other sex toys. He was caught when an Arizona state trooper decided to chat with Rhodes, who had parked his big rig dangerously close to the shoulder of Interstate 40. Inside Rhodes' cab, the trooper found a woman, shackled to the door, covered in welts, cuts, and with a horse bridle secured to her mouth and neck. After Rhodes was arrested, he was tied to a series of hitchhiker murders in multiple states, and received multiple life sentences in Illinois and Texas. I still have many more true and terrifying hitchhiker stories coming up on Weird Darkness. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book 1 is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, Possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book 1 by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book 1 on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of LA. The shortcut was all two-lane roads through total nothingness except for passing through Amboy, California. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town, nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley, with a dormant volcano and lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. It was also at the time a hotspot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign just to prove that I was there to friends who dared me to take that route to I-40. 
I got back in my car and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I'm driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fiero stopped sideways across both lanes, a suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road, a man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a Marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect, as if it was staged. An ambush, perhaps? Was I being paranoid? Something just felt wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. It was the horror movie move. As I scanned the road, I saw a line that I could drive, pass the guy in the road on his left, swerve to the right side of the woman, behind the Fiero, and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies on the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rearview mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and bodies. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 East on-ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on the bodies or stopped my car closer to them. Somehow, I do not think it would have been good. Sometimes, real life can be scarier than a movie. It was 2001, and my friend and I were 17, both female, and driving back from a late movie to my house one night. I lived in a pretty rural area in Maine, about 20 minutes from the nearest town. As we were driving down the highway through the woods, we passed a median with a car sitting in it, facing in the oncoming direction with all its lights off. Right after we drove past it, it flashed its lights, did a three-point turn, and started driving behind us. We giggled that, oh, it must be a gang initiation, we're going to get murdered, because this was Maine, and that was obviously not what was happening. The turnoff for my road was a few miles away, and this car stayed behind us the whole time. We made the left turn, and the car kept going down the highway. Whew. But 30 seconds later, we realized the car must have backed up on the highway and made the turn after us. Now we were getting a little worried. There was still one more road to turn down before we got to my house, this is way in the woods, and the car did the same thing, backed up and made the left after us. Now we were legit freaked. I had a long driveway, and the car followed us right into the driveway and almost up to my house, which had all the lights on because my mom was home. We ran into my house just in time to see the mystery car reverse back down the driveway and drive away. To this day, we still have no idea why that car was following us. If they thought we were someone else or if they'd actually had bad intentions and only changed their mind when they saw that my house lights were on, well, since we only ever saw the front of the car, we didn't get a license plate or a better description other than a blue car. About 15 years ago, my mom and cousin were coming home from visiting my aunt who lived two hours away. The drive takes you through the desert and up some mountains, but there's a shortcut that you can take to avoid the mountains and shave about 10 minutes off your drive time. The only problem is the shortcut takes you literally through the middle of nowhere. It's a two-lane road with nothing for 30 miles, no houses, no shops, no lights, not even those roadside emergency phone booths. They're driving along through the shortcut at about 11 p.m. when they spot something on the road. At first, my cousin thinks it's a rock, so she slows down to go around it. When she gets closer, she realizes it's a lady with long black hair and what looks like a burlap shawl wrapped around her. She's crouched down, facing away from my cousin. My mom says that she thought the lady might have been in trouble, so they pull up next to her and ask if she's okay, if she needs help. My cousin says the lady stood up and looked at them and let out a shriek like a banshee. She insists that her eyes were pitch black and her skin was as white as a sheet. She was really skinny, like almost anorexic skinny. I debate this because it was dark out and her mind might have been playing tricks on her, but nonetheless, it was enough to spook the hell out of her and make her punch the accelerator and get out of there. The lady briefly ran after them, but they lost sight of her after a short bit. They didn't stop for anything, even running a stop sign, until they got to the next town where they stopped at a gas station to get something to drink and to collect their thoughts. A few weeks later, my cousin was telling her co-worker what happened, 
and she said that it might have been a skinwalker that she saw and that she is lucky she got away. That spooked her even worse, so now she won't go through that shortcut. Even when somebody else is driving, she insists on taking the main highway. About two years ago, I was driving home from a family reunion pretty late at night, and the drive was about two hours. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back for work the following day. Most of the drive was on roads with dense bushes and trees on either side, the real creepy ones that you see in a lot of movies. Anyway, I'd been driving about 45 minutes and I was starting to get really tired. You know how sometimes you just suddenly become really tired out of nowhere? Yeah, that happened to me. I knew I wasn't going to last, but I didn't come across any place I felt I could park and safely sleep either. Anyway, after it became clear to me that I was not going to find a place to pull up and my tiredness was not going away, I did something very questionable. I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass behind some bushes to try and hide my car from anybody else who was going to come past. The roads weren't empty. I came across another car every few minutes or so. I made a mental note that the time was 11.22 and then fell asleep. Sometime later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked at the clock, 11.50. The sound stopped after a few seconds, and because I was still extremely tired, I didn't bother looking around and simply went back to sleep. I was later awoken by the same scratching sound, and it was now 12.40. This time it really freaked me out because the sound didn't stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was just an animal inspecting the car, but why would it return almost an hour after it had left the previous time? I looked in my rearview mirror and just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away into the forest. Now, at the time, I thought it was the hook killer, you know, the one that scratches that couple's car and then slaughters the guy when he gets out to investigate. Screw that, I thought, so I get the heck out of there. There was a bend no more than 100 yards up the road, and as I came around to it, there was a car parked off to the side of the road with the driver's side door open. I slowed down just to look to see if anybody was in there. There wasn't. Then I looked in my rearview mirror. I didn't see anything, and all of a sudden this guy comes sprinting around the corner. He starts screaming at me, shouting stuff like, Hey! Hey you! Get out of your car! Now! I noped right out of there and sped off. I never saw the guy again. Moral of the story, don't sleep on the side of a deserted road. A couple of years back, my best friend and I went on a road trip to the United States for a music festival. Met up with some friends, saw lots of things and whatnot. One of our friends comes back home with us. He needed to get back home for school, and his buddies didn't want to head home yet. We decided to drive straight home in shifts. Took 24 hours for the full drive. Anyway, my story starts where I'm driving, night shift, about 2 a.m. It's a beautifully clear night. Full moon, no clouds, middle of the summer party type night. While noticing all of these conditions, I also notice that we have followed the GPS onto a back road and driven into a huge valley. Open fields, not another car or house in sight, and it's important to note that we have not seen anyone or anything relating to human presence for a few hours. Cool beans, doesn't really matter as I know we follow this road for a couple more hours. About 20 minutes after entering this valley, and after loosing all of our connections, we come upon a bridge. As we get closer, I see a car pulled out on the side of the road. Not uncommon, people sleep in pullouts when they can. What's uncommon is this car had all of its windows blacked out. With all of the light from the moon, we should be able to see at least partially inside, but it was completely black. Getting closer, we also realize that it has no license plate that we can see. No big deal, we assume that it's abandoned out here in the boonies. That is, until we pass this vehicle, and almost immediately, its lights turn on and it pulls out behind us on the road. Now, this is where it gets creepy. This vehicle starts tailgating us in the middle of nowhere, and we can't see who is inside or anything. Again, we brush it off. Maybe he's lost, needs to follow somebody out of the area. Doesn't explain the windows being blacked out or the lack of a license plate, but anyway, with this car following us, I start to get an uneasy feeling. Subtle at first, but growing stronger. Soon I get an all-out get-the-heck-away-from-this-vehicle-ASAP feeling. I find it important here to note that I do not frighten easily, I do not panic, and I have only ever gotten this feeling in times when I know for a fact that my life is in danger. I push these feelings aside 
as it seems like the silliest response to a possibly explainable situation. That is, until I see something in the middle of the road. Almost on cue, this car backs off as I and my companions, one of whom was asleep beforehand, try to make out what's in the middle of the road. Coming closer, we see what looks to be a body laying in the middle of the lanes. This is not a big road, and like I said, it was also a back road, still paved but very small. At this moment, and at the sight of what appears to be a body in the road ahead, we start freaking out. I in no way am stopping for no one in this desolate and isolated area. There are no other vehicles around other than the one following us, and I can see no housing or lights for as far as the eye can see. No cell service, no satellite, nothing. I quickly tell the others that I am not stopping and I'm going around or through. By this time, we're almost on it. There's no room to go around as there are no shoulders on the road and deep ditches on the sides, and we're close enough to see now that it's a scarecrow, and I drive over top and onwards. This car, small enough to go around it, continues to follow. I speed up. It speeds up. I slow down. It slows down. Until I punch it. After about two minutes of this, the car slows down, does a U-turn, and drives back. Now my passenger turns to me and says, I swear I saw spikes in that thing. Lucky for us, we were driving a huge truck. The wheel span was bigger than the scarecrow on the road, and we never touched it. It was another half hour before we reached cell services and the satellite picked back up. It wasn't until we reached home at 5 a.m. that we remembered during this time there had been a couple of missing people reported in our province, ones who were on vacation and driving home from the States who never made it home or were ever found. I and my passengers fully believed that we escaped some crazy Wolf Creek type of death for ourselves. We contacted the police about it and ended up making a full police report. However, we were unable to pinpoint the exact location. There wasn't anything they could really do other than file the report. We definitely didn't want this to happen to anybody else, as it was creepy as hell. This didn't happen to me, but I was involved in it. The victim was actually my girlfriend, and I got the story later. At the time my girlfriend and I were attending college together, it was a small school and a pretty quiet place, so most of the students were from the area. My girlfriend, Katie, was one of those. I came from a distance and so lived in a dorm at the college. Katie and I would hang out together in my dorm between classes and even some evenings and weekends when we wanted to be together but didn't feel like going out. It was a Friday night and both of us, being pretty introverted, decided not to do anything crazy, so we planned to spend the night in my room with each other as my roommate was out that night. She wanted some time to go home after classes and assured me that she'd be back around 8. Katie had a car, but she never liked driving. Unless she had to pack around her instrument, she usually took the bus. That Friday night, she had a pretty unnerving experience in doing so that freaked the two of us out for a long while after it happened. She was a small girl, definitely did not look like a college-age student. She was short, thin, and quiet. Standing alone at a bus stop in the dark was probably not ideal, but she preferred that over taking her own car. She waited for the bus, innocent as a rose, when a van drove past her and then again, and then again, then again. She was a bit suspicious, but told herself that he was probably just lost or killing time. The van then pulled over right in front of the stop, and the driver rolled his window down. Isn't it cold out here? he asked. The bus is always late. Hop in, I'll give you a ride. Katie declined politely and took a few steps back, trying to show him that she was not interested in anything he wanted. He asked again if she was absolutely sure that she did not want to ride, and he drove away after she turned him down again. The bus arrived moments later, and she was relieved to step in. To her horror, she then noticed the same van right behind the bus. The van followed the bus directly, and Katie texted me to explain the situation. I could tell that she was panicked, which is not uncommon for her. I offered to talk to her on the phone to calm her nerves, and she accepted. We talked about school and things to get her mind off it. Once her stop came, she felt safe enough to hang up the phone and walk the short distance to the college. When she arrived at my dorm room, she was hysterical. It took me over an hour to comfort her enough to get the story out of her, and this is what she told me. The van had stopped following the bus after getting stuck at a red light, giving the bus a chance to get ahead. However, after getting off at her stop, the van sped up to her. He was driving like a maniac at this point, going at least 20 kilometers over the speed limit. The bus had already pulled away when the van stopped next to her. 
and it pulled over right where she intended to go to get to the college, so in a panic, she bolted the other direction, and the driver raced after her. When she turned her head to look behind her, she noticed he was holding a large butcher knife and waving it in front of him in her direction. She did a wide turn to get back on track to the college, the man following close behind. Lucky for her, he lost his footing on an icy patch on the road, and his fall delayed him enough for her to get far enough ahead. When he got back up, he didn't chase after her again, but instead yelled out, I'll find you and I'll get you! Since then, she has always taken her own car instead of the bus. Keep listening, I still have a few more hitchhiking horror stories to share with you when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In South Africa, we have a lot of hijackings, and for a while, the favored method to stop a car was to play dead in the road. Of course, it doesn't take long for people to figure out that stopping to help people on the road is a bad idea, and that is where my friend of a friend joins the story. On his way home from work one night – he lived in a small holding – he sees a body on the road about a kilometer from his house. He quickly realized what was up and decided to just drive up onto the pavement – curb for the Yanks, I think – and go around the body without stopping. He got home about two minutes later, ran inside, and called the police. When he saw them coming down the road, he returned to where he had seen the body to tell them where to start their search. Obviously, there was no body, but what they did find was quite surprising. Three dead hijackers hiding in the long grass of the curb, as it turns out. When he had driven up on the curb to avoid the dead guy, he had crushed all of the accomplices. The dead guy was never found, as far as I know. This is a true story told to me by a man who'd been working as a murder investigator for over 30 years at the time. I was told this story after asking what the creepiest case that he'd ever been involved in was. This happened in northern Scandinavia in the late 80s in a part of the country that's mostly covered in dense pine forest. On the highway between cities in this part of the country, you do come across the occasional villages and secluded houses, but there are stretches that seem to go on forever, with only pine trees as far as you can see. A young girl in her early 20s was taking a motor coach home after being on a trip down south, presumably visiting friends or relatives. This happened just as winter was approaching, and it was freezing outside after nightfall. This girl lived in one of these really small communities that you pass along the highway, but during the bus trip she fell asleep and missed her stop. Looking at her watch, she realized that they'd passed it only recently and that if she were to get off, she'd be able to walk back in approximately three hours. Either that or get off in the next city where she didn't know anybody and had no place to stay. She explained all this to the bus driver, who pulled off at the next parking space and let her off. That was the last time anyone saw her. Almost 15 years later, long after the search for her had been given up, she is stumbled upon by a hiker. Her dead body was found tied to a tree, well over an hour's walk from the road into the dense, almost impassable forest. The autopsy showed no signs of physical violence of any kind. Someone had just left her there, alive. I was a pretty brave person when I was younger. Or maybe I had that sense of invincibility that comes with youth. 
I'd survived some things. The stalker, who pursued my sister and I for over a year and a half, being sexually assaulted, two house fires, and growing up in a house that I swear to you was haunted. Not in that Disney way, either. I'm talking torture chamber in the basement and strange things going on. Anyway, I suppose, looking back, that having been through all of that made me feel a little like either I was sort of invincible or maybe I just assumed that I'd gotten all the bad stuff out of the way and nothing else would happen. Whatever it was, I learned to know better. When I was 17, I didn't have a driver's license. In fact, I was 36 before I got mine. I walked most places, occasionally catching rides with friends and, less occasionally, hitchhiking. The night in question was one of those seldom-seen occasions when I'd decide to hitchhike having worked late and being too exhausted to walk. Now, Most of the time when I'd hitch a ride, I wouldn't get in the car with a lone man. Only women, or rarely men with a wife or girlfriend and or kids in the car. This night, though, cars were few and far between and it was cold, and really, if I'm being perfectly frank, when he pulled over I took a good look and figured I, I could take him if he tried anything. He was on the slender side and had a strange frailness about him, even though he looked healthy enough. I got into the car after we agreed on a destination. We exchanged names, and I warmed my fingers in front of the heating vent. He spoke quietly, asking a few questions along the lines of, was I a local? How did I like living there? He said that he'd only been there for a couple of months, but found it beautiful and hoped that he could find happiness there. That comment struck me as a little odd, but I brushed it off. It began to snow, and the road quickly got slippery, so he slowed and kept his eyes straight out the windshield, driving silently. I was okay with that, as small talk was never my forte. About ten minutes later, I noticed a car near the intersection we were approaching seemed to be sliding, so I said, watch out! He immediately hit the gas, shooting through the intersection, and burst out with, don't ever scream at me! Needless to say, I was taken aback. I said, look, this is close enough, just pull over here and I can get there. He didn't seem to hear me. Um, Richard, did you hear me? I said you can pull over here and let me out. No response. He just stared, straight ahead, driving faster now than he had been since it began to snow. To say that I was scared doesn't seem to cover the depth of the fear that began to arise in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was dang sure not going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile, he began to mumble under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed that he was speaking to me, so I said, hmm, I couldn't hear you. He began to speak quietly and rapidly, saying things like, you're always yelling at me. I told you time and again I do not appreciate being yelled at, but do you listen? No! Well, I'm done listening to you now. Do you hear that? I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to say in response or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car, but nixed that idea when I realized the door lock was missing. There was just a silver-lined hole where it should have been. I'd started to cry and debate with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and hoping for the best. At least I figured there was a chance I'd survive that. When he suddenly looked at me for the first time that I'd gotten into the car. He blinked several times, rapidly, then slowed the car pulling into a gas station. I waited to see if he'd unlock the doors, not wanting to say anything to set him off again. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I think I'd better let you out here, and hit the button to open the locks. I wasn't about to hesitate. I jumped out of the car as if it were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so dang sad that I hesitated. He apologized, said that he was sorry if he had frightened me, that he never would have harmed me, and asked if I'd be able to get home okay. I said I would, and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station lot, but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the heck he was up to and was about to run into the station, but he opened his window and yelled to me, waving something in his hand. My hat. I had left it on his seat. I wearily approached his side of the car and he handed it to me, apologizing again. I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure that he was out of sight before moving on so he wouldn't know which direction I was heading. I decided to go to a friend's instead of home. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on, and out fell a piece of paper. Folded into the paper was a $100 bill. The paper said, I'm sorry, please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. 
In fact, it was the last time I ever hitched a ride home. I used to drive I-80 between San Francisco and Cheyenne, Wyoming a lot. It's about 16 to 20 hours of driving, depending on weather and traffic and whatever. One night I was driving and the car starts making this odd grinding noise, like I ran over something that got stuck. It's about 2 a.m. I pull into a rest stop, well lit, and wake up my buddy who was sleeping. I explained it to him as we get out of the car, we both hear what sounds like a kid crying. There are no other cars at the rest stop, but we frequently heard stories about child trafficking and kidnapping nearby, so we decided to check it out. We grab our flashlights and head toward the noise, which is coming from the bathrooms. As we get closer, we realize it's coming from the women's bathroom, and it is a low, dull sobbing. We're prepared for the worst. We walk in expecting to see some brutally beaten and or raped eight-year-old or something, and we see nothing. The sound is still there, and it's still clearly coming from the room, but the room is empty. We turn on the lights. Still nothing. Check each stall. The trash can. Nothing. Even start looking for where in the room the sound's coming from. Nothing. Is it a hidden speaker? Are we on candid camera? What the hell? My buddy climbs up on one of the stalls to get to the top window in the rest stop, which is vented out and open. He closes it, and the noise stops. Completely. Opens it, and there's no more noise. We sit there for a few seconds, staring at each other. He shrugs. Then the window slams shut again without him touching it. We were out of that bathroom in seconds. The noise starts up about ten seconds later as we get to the car, and we are tearing out of the parking lot within ten more seconds. The grinding noise is still there, so this time I pull over a few miles later at a Flying J truck stop. Well lit, sometimes occupied. Couple of truckers there, no other civilians like us. We check under the car. There is a red and silver piece of metal wedged between part of the car and the road, about a half inch or so off the ground. So with us in the car, it would definitely have been grinding against the ground. Can't remove it by hand, it's really wedged in there, so we kick at it to bend it and figure we'll remove it when we get back. A week later, I had my mechanic take it out when he was doing a service. It was part of a kid's tricycle. The red area on the back where somebody can stand. My dad drives in Texas a lot, but there's a particular road that he always avoids. I'm not sure what road it is, but he says it's the middle of old Native American land. One night, as he was driving through, he kept seeing shadows running alongside his trailer. Every once in a while, he'd hear a loud bang as if someone was slapping the side of the trailer. He decided to stop and see if a tire had blown, because that's really the only thing that could be making that noise. He did his usual walk around, checking the tires, but as he turned the corner, he heard a laugh and a shadow took off running down the road. Needless to say, he crapped his pants, jumped in the truck, and did not stop until daylight. Apparently, he saw the skinwalker standing on the side of the road with his arms crossed about 15 miles later. Those last two stories make for a good segue into our next section. It's another scary version of hitchhiking horrors, the Phantom Hitchhiker. The legend of the Phantom Hitchhiker hardly needs an introduction. The core story concerns a traveler who offers a ride to a vulnerable-looking pedestrian, only to find his passenger has disappeared without a trace. Later, investigations reveal that the passenger was a supernatural entity, not a living human being at all. Hitchhiking Ghosts up next on Weird Darkness. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, 
for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. You've most likely heard the story. A person's driving down a lonely road at night when they see a hitchhiker, often a young woman ahead. The woman's offered a ride and gets into the vehicle, usually the back seat. The hitchhiker never says a word and, after traveling some distance, vanishes without a trace. For example, Jerry was driving home late one night when he saw a young lady waiting by a bus stop. He stopped his car and told her that he didn't think the buses were running so late at night and offered her a ride. The fall night air was getting chilly, so he took off his jacket and gave it to her. Although his passenger wasn't much for a conversation, he did manage to learn the girl's name was Mary and that she was on her way home. After driving for an hour, they arrived at her home. Jerry said goodnight. She went in the front door, and he went home himself. The next day, he remembered that Mary still had his jacket, so he drove to her house and knocked on the door. An old woman answered. John told her about the ride that he had given her daughter Mary and explained that he'd come back to get the jacket that he had lent to her. The old woman looked very confused. John noticed a picture of Mary on the fireplace mantel. He pointed to it and told the old woman that that was the girl he had given a ride to. With her voice shaking, the old woman told Jerry that her daughter had been dead for many years, the result of an auto accident while she was trying to get home, and she was buried in a cemetery about an hour away. Jerry ran to his car and drove to the cemetery. He found his jacket neatly folded on top of a grave. The name on the gravestone was Mary. You've probably heard some version of the late night ride, perhaps around a campfire or at a Halloween party. The ghostly hitchhiker is a popular character in American folktales, and while many variations exist, many purportedly true, the stories tend to follow a formula. A motorist, usually a man, picks up a lonely hitchhiker, generally a young female. He transports her to her destination, where she either vanishes or enters a house. If she enters a house, the driver usually has a reason to come back or follow her. For example, he wanted the jacket that he loaned her, or he wants to return something she left in the car, or sometimes if the destination is a house and she vanishes when the car arrives at the destination, he wants an explanation as to why she disappeared. When he knocks on the door, he learns from a grieving loved one that the passenger died many years ago. If he's trying to reclaim an item, it can usually be found at her gravesite. The age of these stories is unknown, but they have existed in the United States since the days when we traveled by wagons, and possibly even earlier than that in other places. For example, in the Bible, the Apostle Philip hitches a ride with an Ethiopian, whom he baptizes before the man vanishes. There are roads throughout the world purported to host a ghostly traveler looking for a ride back to loved ones or to their final resting place. Given that this particular story is found in different variations throughout the world, perhaps there is more to these phantom hitchhikers than a simple scare. The simple formula of the story also means that it's highly customizable. Jerry can easily become my friend Harry or when my dad was in college coming home for the weekend. Similarly, the address can be anywhere. It can be an old graveyard or abandoned house or tree-lined road. The hitchhiker can be the daughter of any couple known to have lost a daughter to a car accident. During this period, there was also a rise in drag racing, resulting in an increase in teen deaths overall. Sounds like Last Kiss were based on these types of events. Why does this work? In the story I just relayed, a man stops for a young woman waiting at a bus stop and thinking of the late hour and the difficulty she might have in getting home and offers her a ride. Hitchhiking was also a fairly common practice until recently. In the 1950s and 1960s, and even into the 1970s, hitchhiking was a common means of making your way around the country. It becomes less believable today in the context of our current society. One of the basic rules we learn as children is that you never, ever, ever get into a car with a stranger. And yet, time after time, these women do just that and the men seem to have no ill intent. They simply want to assure the young woman gets home safely. 
These stories exhibit a basic concern for others, highlighting a sense of neighborliness and trust that fits with the social perceptions of relationships during that period. These messages can be buried in today's tales of caution. In these early stories, there seems to be two lessons to be taken from these types of ghost stories. First, there is a reminder of the importance of community, that you could depend on a stranger for help if you were in need. Second, there is a warning, whether that's going too fast or drinking and driving, because you too could end up like Mary. While the drivers who pick up these passengers are usually male, the phantom passengers suggest a shadowy fate for the driver if they're not careful. After all, they could survive, but their passengers, their girlfriends, and other loved ones might not. These stories aren't necessarily spine-tingling, but they do reflect larger social concerns and are designed to encourage behavior change. This is perhaps best illustrated tracing the ways these stories change with time. A darker variation of the hitchhiker story began to emerge in the late 1970s, becoming popular and widespread in the 1980s. One summer day, a woman pulled into a gas station. As the attendant pumped the gas, the woman told the attendant that she was in a hurry to pick up her daughter, who would soon be finishing her art class. While she was waiting, a man walked over to her car. He explained to her that his rental car had died and he needed a ride to an appointment. The location was just down the road from her daughter's art class, so she told him she'd be happy to give him a ride. He put his briefcase in the back seat and said that he was going to the men's room quickly. A few minutes passed and the woman looked at her watch. Realizing she'd be late, she drove off quickly, forgetting that the man was supposed to be coming back to her car. She thought nothing of it until she and her daughter pulled into their driveway. She saw the man's briefcase and realized she had forgotten the man completely. She opened the briefcase, looking for some sort of identification. All she found inside was a knife and a roll of duct tape. This version is also formulaic, but in this case the protagonist is usually a woman. The message is also a warning and an indication of public awareness of violence against women, which had previously not been something openly discussed. The story is closer to the messages we learn as children about the dangers of trusting strangers. This version has grown more complicated and detailed with time. It amplifies the stranger, sending a clear warning about the dangers of trusting too easily. It demonstrates a shift in societal thinking, which in turn reflects larger events of the time. The early 1980s was a period of tremendous change. John Lennon was assassinated, Reagan was elected, and the U.S. invaded Grenada in the battle against communism. The world was changing rapidly and seemingly not for the better in the eyes of many. These stories can provide insights about the social organization of the time. In addition to providing a slight chill, they're also apt teaching tools. People of all ages are more likely to pay attention if the story seems familiar and if it is somewhat tragic or frightening. There are scary stories in many cultures reserved just for frightening children to ensure they behave. There's a lot that could be learned from folklore. The question is, though, is there a real case of the phantom hitchhiker that might be the basis for the folklore or modern version of the legend? The answer would seem to be yes. Our first phantom ghost story takes place on Good Friday in March of 1968. Maria Rowe and her fiancé were driving to her parents' home in Uniondale on the N9, about 200 miles from Cape Town, South Africa. The weather suddenly turned bad, and fierce winds forced their car into a ditch. Her fiancé survived the crash. Maria, however, was killed instantly. It was certainly a tragic event, but one which occurs every day all around the world. What makes the story of Maria Rowe unique among traffic fatalities is what happened years after her death. A man named Anton Lagrange was driving on the N9 during Easter week of 1976, not far from the site of Maria Rowe's fatal crash. It was late at night when he saw a figure standing at the side of the road. As he got closer, he could make out that it was a woman apparently hitchhiking. Lagrange stopped and offered the woman a ride, which she accepted without saying a word. She opened the rear passenger side door and got into the back seat. Lagrange asked the stranger where she was going, but there was no response. He commented that it was rather dangerous for a young woman to be hitchhiking alone at that time of night. Again, silence. Lagrange then turned and looked into the back seat. The hitchhiker was gone, and Lagrange was scared and confused. He saw the woman get into the car. 
He could even describe her, and now she had vanished. LaGrange thought that perhaps the woman had fallen out of the car at some point and went to the closest police station, Uniondale, to report the incident. Once at the police station, LaGrange began to tell the desk sergeant of the strange occurrence that he had just experienced. No doubt LaGrange's tale of the vanishing hitchhiker was met with considerable doubt. The possibility remained, however, that a young woman might be lying injured or dead along the N9. With that possibility in mind, the officer agreed to follow LaGrange back to the area of the strange encounter. The officer followed close behind as LaGrange approached the area of the occurrence. To the officer's amazement, he witnessed LaGrange's rear passenger door open and close as LaGrange's car passed the location where he had picked up the phantom hitchhiker. Thinking that LaGrange might be trying to pull off a hoax, the officer agreed to follow him past the location one more time. This time, LaGrange would drive with the interior car lights on and the doors would be locked. Despite the precautions, the officer again saw the rear passenger side door open and close as the two passed the same area, and this time the officer heard the sound of a woman laughing as the door was opened by the phantom hitchhiker. The baffled police officer soon contacted fellow Uniondale officer Sergeant Pat McDonald. McDonald was the first officer to arrive on the scene of the Maria Rowe crash. McDonald met with LaGrange and handed him a stack of photos. The pictures were all of young women and looked much alike. Despite the similarities of the images, LaGrange was able to quickly pick out the picture of the phantom hitchhiker. It was Maria Rowe. The next report of the phantom hitchhiker came in 1978. Dolly Van Jarsveld was riding his motorcycle on the N9 heading towards Uniondale to visit his girlfriend for Easter. As he rode, he spotted a female hitchhiker ahead and stopped to offer her a ride. She said nothing but put on a helmet and got on the back of the bike, and Van Jarsveld sped off with a hitchhiker hanging onto him tightly. Van Jarsveld said that he was suddenly overcome with a feeling of strangeness and at just that moment experienced what he described as a twitch, and the phantom hitchhiker, which matched the description of Maria Rowe, had vanished. Uniondale journalist Janie Meyer has followed the Maria Rowe story for more than 30 years now. One of the theories of why she apparently can't go to rest is that she was asleep in the car when the accident happened and she didn't prepare herself for death, Janie says. She wanted to finalize her wedding arrangements, and the theory is that she will carry on until she reaches her destination. Another hitchhiking specter is said to be that of a young woman who haunts the underpass of a railroad bridge over East Main Street in Jamestown, North Carolina. Known as Lydia, she has been seen on rainy and foggy nights as she walks alone or stands beside the road searching for help to get back home. The legend of Lydia is based on sightings and stories over the past 70 or more years of a young woman in white as she stands by the road, attempting to flag down passing motorists for help. The ghost is believed to be that of a young woman who died tragically at the bridge many, many years ago. The stories share a common detail of a fatal car accident that occurred as a boy and girl drove on a rainy night to a dance, perhaps the prom. Since then, Lydia's spirit, still robed in her white dress, returns to the scene, looking for a ride home or perhaps to the dance. Local lore tells of the first sighting of Lydia around 1924. North Carolina folklorist Nancy Roberts included the account of an eerie sighting near the bridge of a woman in her 1959 An Illustrated Guide to Ghosts and Mysterious Occurrences in the Old North State. As collected from a man named Burke Hardison, he told of his encounter with a young woman as he traveled home to High Point on a rainy and foggy night when he was a student at North Carolina State in 1924. Back then, the bridge was over Highway 70, although since abandoned but very close to the present-day Jamestown Bridge over Main Street. Hardison claimed to see a girl dressed in a white gown. She signaled for him to stop and asked him to help her get to High Point. He drove her home, and when he went to get out of the car, she had vanished into thin air. He knocked on the door of the house, asked if the girl was there, only to learn from her mother that she had been killed in a car accident at a nearby underpass the year before. There have been many attempts to match records and evidence with a real person named Lydia, but none have turned up any conclusive proof of a young woman named Lydia who may have died in an automobile accident in the area during the 1920s. In recent years, two local researchers who have long chased the Lydia legend, Amy Greer and Michael Renegar, came upon an article in the Greensboro Patriot from June 21, 1920 that reported the tragic death of a young woman named Annie Jackson 
who had been killed on the High Point Road, about three miles from High Point and close to the location of both the old and current bridge, when the driver lost control of the vehicle, and he was thrown from the car. The article noted that the road was wet and the car turned turtle. Might this be the origin of the ghost and legend? Many people over the years have claimed to see the girl in white alongside the road. Some have stopped to help, only to observe her vanish when they stepped out of their cars or turned around for a moment. Today, the old bridge is cloaked in vines and overgrowth, giving it the aura of mystery and the supernatural. Both underpasses have become graffiti shrines to the folk legend, as generations of residents have claimed to see Lydia in her long white dress standing by the road, waiting for help. Another strange, ghostly story. Many years ago, a young tradesman from Bedfordshire decided that he'd play the Good Samaritan and pick up a stranded traveler. It was to prove to be one of the most chilling and convincing paranormal encounters of modern times. Late in the evening of October 12, 1979, 26-year-old carpet fitter Roy Fulton from Dunstable was returning home from a pub darts match in nearby Light and Buzzard when he stopped to get a lift to a young man standing on an isolated stretch of Station Road on the outskirts of Stanbridge. Notions of ghosts and the supernatural were far from Fulton's mind, as being an avid Liverpool supporter, he was casting his thoughts ahead to the following day's match and the prospects of his favorite team. In the glare of the minivan's headlights, he saw a youth standing on the near side verge thumbing for a lift. Deciding the young man was going to either Tottenhoe or Dunstable, Fulton came to a halt in front of the hitchhiker who walked along the road towards the van. He was casually dressed in dark trousers and jumper and wore a white-collared shirt. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The man opened the passenger door and got in. When asked where he wanted to go, his only response was to point ahead further down the misty road. Fulton let in the minivan's clutch and the van pulled away. The journey continued in silence for some minutes until Fulton decided to offer the youth a cigarette. It was the point where what had been a completely ordinary and familiar situation suddenly crossed over a threshold into the strange and frightening world of the unknown. I leant forward and picked up the packet of cigarettes, he later recalled, turned around to offer the lad one, and that man or boy was not sitting there. Stunned, Fulton pulled the mini to a halt and, turning on the interior light, looked into the back, thinking the youth had somehow climbed into the rear of the van. There was nothing there. Roy Fulton was completely alone. Now terrified, Fulton drove in a panic to his local pub, the Glider in Lowther Road, Dunstable. Ashen-faced and shaking, he blurted out his terrifying story to the landlord, Bill Stone, and a group of regulars. Two things haunted him about his experience. That the eerie, pale-faced youth was somehow part of an earlier traffic accident which had not been reported, and secondly, that the sad, silent figure would somehow follow him home. Fulton was later interviewed by writer and researcher Michael Goss, and in 1985 took part in the respected television documentary series Arthur C. Clarke's World of Strange Powers. On both occasions, he told the same story without any deviations or embellishments, that one night in October 1979, he took a ghost for a ride. Many countries as diverse and wide apart as Sweden, Pakistan, Canada, Korea, and South Africa all have their own individual and specific phantom hitchhiker tales, but the experience of Bedfordshire motorist Roy Fulton ranks as one of the most compelling and thought-provoking of all. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. That's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, find my other podcast, Church of the Undead, and more. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Hitchhiker original story at the beginning of this episode was written by Honey Bunny 00. 
Hitchhiking Horror Stories were compiled by Isadora Teak and Jason Shelton from Ranker.com, Eric Redding from ThoughtCatalog.com, and from ScaryCarries.com. Hitchhiking Ghosts came from Animalian.com, Medium.com, and Paul Adams for the HistoryPress.co.uk, along with Crystal DaCosta for ScientificAmerican.com. Again, you can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And a final thought from Jim Rohn. If you really want to do something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.